uh, we are entering our second part of today uh, of this morning, which is a keynote speech by Professor Peter Ball. Um, my work on Chinese history in network analysis comes under the influence of several great minds at Harvard, where I pursued my postgraduate studies. Among them, probably the most important is Professor Peter K. Ball, who has not only showed me the way to Chinese history, but has also ignited my interest in the use of computational methods. So it is my great honor to have him here as the keynote speaker for this conference. Professor Peter K. Ball, as many of you the, uh, must have known, is the Charles Cos uh, Coswell Professor of East Asian Language and Civilizations at Harvard University. His research has centered on the history of China's cultural elites or the literati at the national and the local levels from the 7th century to the 17th century, spanning 1,000 years. But more importantly for us today, He's also a pioneer in exploring how historians, uh, his, his, uh, how historians work could benefit from the cutting edge computational technologies. Starting from the 1990s, he has collaborated with scholars at Fudan University in Shanghai, China on the China Historical GIS project to create a geographical information system for the two millennium of Chinese history. From 2013 to 2018, he was the vice provost at Harvard University, responsible for developing Harvard X and the, uh, uh, that connects online learning and residential learning. In the international collaboration that involves the Harvard University, Academia Seneca, Peking University, among many other research institutions, Professor Paul also directs the China Biographical Database Project, the CBDB project, which we will learn more about today in the workshop session. So we are very grateful to have his presence among us today. Without further ado, please join me uh, in welcoming Professor Peter Bo. Thank you, Chan Song. I hope uh, my screen is now visible. Okay. Um, why are networks interesting? Um, for me, it's because it gives us insight into how people pursue their interests. So, as Chen Zhou has already mentioned, at a macro level, uh, the U.S. and China are sometimes contrasted. Western Europe, even more so, more so, is a society built on laws, let's say, on institutions in China, built on relationships. In fact, of course, both things exist in China. But I do think it's important to consider change over time and the importance of things like institutions and relationships. Imagine, for example, the Qin Dynasty, right, as a society that stresses legal systems, institutions, or contrast the Mongols' uh, approach to literati, which is much more based on relationships and recommendation, versus the Ming Dynasty, which tries to institutionalize the role of literati of the Shiren in society. Um, networks, of course, are relationships. Uh, relationships between two points, which can be added to and extended to, to be aggregated. Um, now, some data, data sets or data points or, or networks are, are not about people, but about goods. Imagine supply chains, for example. But I'm interested in social network, networks of people. People have agency. They make choices. Um, and networks are structures that help define the choices that are available to them. This is how I would read uh, uh, Paget's and Powell's sort of comments that in the short run, actor, actors make relations, in the long run, relations make actors. Um, there are, of course, uh, straightforward networks, political uh, networks. Here from the Chuncho, the Spring and Autumn Annals, attributed to Confucius, we have an early example of network information being provided, where we have the nodes. Um, the, uh, um, ah, sorry, the screen got messed up. Um, the nodes between people, the edges, the relationship that makes a covenant, a date, which is the month and a place, um, to the Chuncho as the China's first database. But there's been recently a lot of interesting work. Uh, Jack Chun, for example, and collaborators on the Shishuo Xinyu, that a medieval book um, showing how people appear in certain chapters and con configurations of people. Um, Hilda de Wert and her collaborators showing 
letter exchanges and, and the different roles people play in these networks. Um, Chen Sung, in an article uh, for the Journal of Chinese uh, History special issue on digital humanities, looking at networks that relate authors and inscriptions in schools and places. All these are uh, recent examples of scholarship using network analysis. I'm going to be talking about literati networks and literati networks in this case, taking uh, that are put together by mining various sources and mining sources using the China Biographical Database. And in this case, I'm going to do a quick search that looks for the students of Zhu Xi. And I'm going to save that to a network analysis program, which you'll eventually see. And I get one result of the query in, in the China Biographical Databases. I find 506 people who are listed as having, um, as students of Zhu Xi. Now, the original sources, of course, are diverse for the China Biographical Database. And certainly when it comes to kinship, our most important source are epitaphs, the mudraming. Now I've shown two mudraming here, both of which are unusual. The one by Su Shi for his wet nurse, famous piece is unusual because rarely do we have epitaphs for people who are not members of the elite. And the one on the right is unusual, um, a Tang one, uh, not so much because it's long and detailed, but because it's for an elite woman. Um, around 10%, only 10% of the people in the China Biographical Database are women, in fact. The value of an epitaph is that it gives us three generations of ancestors and all the descendants at the time the epitaph was written. It's good for official careers, and thus epitaph is both for officials, but also tells us about their kin. It gives us a certain slice of elite life. Um, epitaph becomes a source, um, a source beginning with, let's say, a record of conduct that is sent to the Bureau of Historiography of Court, which ends up in court histories, which ends up in dynastic histories, but also goes to the writers commissioned to compose the mudraming um, or the mubiao. Um, the epitaph. And the writer may give it to the family, which puts it in the grave, but the writer may also include it in a literary collection. The family may include it in the genealogy. And of course, tomb robbers and archaeologists um, take it out of the grave and publish it, or may or may not publish it. The second important source um, is the literary collection, the Wenji uh, that we find. And in Sung, really, there's an explosion of one Wenji. So in Tang, most of our epitaphs are dug up. And we have a limited number of Wenji with epitaphs, around 300, I believe, in Tang Wenji. But when we turn to Sung, all of a sudden, we find we have around five to 7,000 recorded uh, epitaphs, and many more written ones that have been excavated from the ground. But what is the significance of materials appearing in literary collections? Because it's not only a source for epitaphs, it's also a sor source for all sorts of occasional writings. That is, writings that are produced for a particular occasion, um, and thus inherently a social occasion. They're not only biographies, such as the Mu Ming, the epitaph, there's prefaces and postfaces, xu and ho xu, to books. There are prefaces, so-called prefaces, uh, written for individuals, studied by, by Chen Wanli in Taiwan. There's song xu. There are records of events, uh, the completion of a school, and a studio or, or, or a garden, and so on. There are letters between people, poetry in various genres, colophons written on the works of others. All these. All these are um, examples of social relationships or can be treated as social relationships and can be extracted from the Wenji. And thanks to the work of Wang Di and others, 
we've been able to extract an enormous number of social relationships from literary collections, relying on the literary exchange between people. But it's important to keep in mind that the literary exchange between people is only a very, very small proportion of their social interactions. Consider, for example, Guo Bi's diary uh, from the 13th, 14th century. Guo Bi has a diary which covers 15 months when he was seeking employment in Zhenjiang and then in Hangzhou. His diary records 2,452 interactions with 761 unique individuals. Let us assume that that is typical for literati at the time, seeking to make connections to others and working hard at it. Perhaps Guo Bi was more extreme. Nevertheless, it reminds us that our literary collection uh, relationships, associations, are a limited number of the total things that happened in history. There are also, of course, very important collections of biographies. Uh, this is an example from the 17th century of the uh, short biographies of, uh, based on the membership list of the Restoration Society, the Fuxia. And these biographies, in this case, as you can see, have been supplemented with information from local gazetteers. And the local gazetteer is the third important source for social information. Gazetteers have biographies, as you see on the right. And in this case, a Yuan purse dynasty literatus from Jinhua Xian, who was a, studied with Bai Yun Xu, Xu Gong, that is Xu Qian. But gazetteers also have lists. For example, those passing the highest level civil service examination, the Jinshu. Um, but if you, as you'll see here, this particular achievement recorded in gazetteers, exceptional within a county or a prefecture. Still, the people who achieve this are not necessarily well known. In this listing in a, in a gazetteer, we see that in some cases, all that is recorded is the name of the person and the county he comes from. In some cases, it includes the county and the position he held, usually a local government position. And in rare cases, it says, oh, see the biography in this gazetteer. Right? And those three examples are, high, are, are circled on the slide. Now, if we look at Zhu Xi's students, um, to come back to this problem of Zhu Xi's students, we see um, that we have a large number of people on the left, and then on the right, what I've done is I've asked how many of these people who are Jushi students have connections with each other? And there it turns out it's actually a fairly limited number, as you see on the right hand picture. Now, that suggests that the vast majority of Jushi students exist for us only as a name, right? somebody who asks Zhu Xi a question once, for example, or whose biography records that they studied with Zhu Xi. Only a few of them have connections to other people. However, if we take all of Zhu Xi's students and ask, who are they connected to in any way through their writings and through literary connections, we get a much more interesting graph, a graph that shows that there are numerous people right, um, in a larger network and that some of these people are more central than others. Not that they were Jushi students, but Jushi students also had connections to them. And so here we see people like Jushi, Zhou Bida, Yang Wanli, Wei Liang Wang, and so on, who are figures in this network. Now, when we go on and say, okay, let's reduce the network only to those people who have connections with at least eight people, what we see here is another graph. And in this graph, right, all of them have one G, which suggests to us a problem. The problem is that the network we've constructed here is really a reflection, or so it seems, a reflection 
of who has a Wenji, a literary collection. Now, um, that's true when I look, when I filter my graph for people who have connections to at least eight other individuals. But if I change the filter to ask who has connections to at least four other people and focus in on a certain part of the graph, then it turns out that among the one, two, three, four, five, um, 10 people listed here, only three of them have one G and not even full one G. And so what we're starting to see is in fact that even though we're relying on literary collections, when we look at the full network, we start to see many more people in it. And we start to see people about whom we, for whom we do not have literary collections. Now, most Wenji from the Song dynasty are lost. If I take just the prefecture of Jinhuafu in the Ming, or Wuzhou in Song and Yuan, in Song and Yuan, 148 individuals had at least one literary collection. But today, only 40 of those collections are extant. In other words, we've seen tremendous loss in the number of literary collections. But what we've seen is that, in fact, we can probably reconstruct all the people and their connections who participated in this form of literati life through writing. And this brings me then to my topic of uh, collegiality uh, and kinship in Sung and Yuan, particularly in Sung and Yuan Wuzhou. Recall that when we're looking at literati networks, we're talking about the literati as a literate group, a source of civil officials, people who self-identify as members of the national elite, who are aligned with government, who take civil service examinations when they're available, because in much of the UN they're not, and who are involved in schools, which exist in both school, uh, Sung and Yuan. Um, in, under the Mongols, the institutional structures that maintained literati privilege were weakened. But in some places, and Jinhua Wuzhou is a place where this happened, um, literati networks persisted. And so I created a data set of Wuzhou literati and their camp, right? Uh, are shown here, men and women found in the China Biographical Database is showing totals by dynasty the numbers of people um, given with index years. In this case, the index year used was the 60th year of life. CBDB currently uses the presumptive birth year. And so you see that we have actually a fairly large number of people who we can date fairly reliably uh, to, to the prefecture and to the various counties within it. And using this data set, I began to generate some queries. And I began with the question of what happened to kinship. Um, if I look in Southern Sung and I find the kinship relationship using what in CBDB is called the 2211 um, algorithm, it is two generations prior to the person, two generations later, one generation or, or one relationship by marriage, one distance and one distance collateral, that is, let's say, a brother. Um, or a father's brother or something like this, um, I find that on the left side, Southern Sung Wuzhou literati kinship is widely spread, relatively speaking. But when I turn to Yuan this, and the picture on the right, we see that kinship has dramatically narrowed. And, and this fits what social historians talk about as the narrowing of the geographic kinship. Um, particularly in Southern Sung and the emergence of local elites, except in, in, in Jinhua and in Wuzhou, this really happens in Yuan more than in Southern Sung. Um, and when we look at the at kinship in Southern Sung, and we look at the giant component, that is this, the biggest component in the network where everyone is connected together. What we see is that in fact, Jinhua and Southern Sung had a prefectural-wide 
marriage network and one that extended beyond the prefecture, um, where the colored, the colored nodes are from various different counties in Wuzhou, the seven different counties, and the gray is for people with unknown addresses or people from exterior, ex, uh, outside of the prefecture. When we look, we would expect at this point that given the narrowing geographic scope of kinship in Yuan, that this giant component would become even larger. But it turns out that is not the case. This is the giant component of Yuan dynasty kinship in Wuzhou. And what we see is that it's become particularized to the county level. So that we'll see relationships within counties, but not really a prefectural wide relationship. What does this mean? Does this mean that the literati uh, groups and associations within Jinhua collapsed? Right? And that has become really not a prefectural relation, set of relationships, but merely county relationships reflecting kinship? Well, it turns out that that's not true, because in fact, there is a prefecture wide literati network based on literary and scholarly associations, that is, intellectual and literary associations among literati. Um, on the left is the giant component for people with index years from 1180 to 12. 94, that is people who lived through this in, became mature, let's say, um, in, in late Southern Song and lived into or lived into early Yuan. And on the right, we see people who um, were active in Yuan into early Ming. Now, both of these are fairly extensive networks, um, but they have some important differences. One difference is that the density of the network increases dramatically in uh, the UN dynasty. And the number of connections averaged over years, right, is um, dramatically greater in the later period than in the Song. So what we see is that there's more collegiality, more networking, even though kinship ties or precisely because perhaps kinship ties have broken down, there are now greater number of social connections. Um, but when we ask the following question, how many of the central people in the literati network in Southern Song, right, are from Wuzhou, we find that most of the central figures for Wuzhou literati are not from Wuzhou themselves. In fact, we have Lu Zuchen, Shan Liang, uh, Lu Zuchen, his brother, uh, Lu Zuchen's brother, Wang Bo, Wang Huai. But most people led by Zhu Xi right, are in fact from outside. So literati within Wuzhou and Southern Song are more connected to people outside, just as their kinship is more connected to people outside than to inside. When we turn to a, um, gra a chart, right, from using Gephi to look at that, so the people in gray are from Wuzhou and the people in orange or yellow are from outside. We see that although there are some leading figures in Wuzhou, most of the people who figure centrally in literati networks of Wuzhou literati are not Wuzhou people. When we turn to the UN dynasty, the situation is rather different. Here, what we find is that the most important figures, with the exception, let's say, of Yu Ji, who is from uh, Jiang, uh, Jiangxi, the most important figures are, in fact, from Wuzhou, from Pujang, from Jinhua, from Yiwu, uh, and other uh, counties uh, from Dongyang counties within Wuzhou. And this is confirmed when we look at the numbers. The gray shows the um, leading people, the most central people in the Wuzhou literati network for Yuan dynasty uh, literati. And we've seen a dramatic change. Now, 
we've seen that change, but um, what does it tell us? It makes sense. It says, okay, if kinship networks are breaking down at the prefectural level, literati who need connections, who during the UN dynasty need recommendations to get ahead to pursue their interests, that now all of a sudden they find that they um, need to turn to local people or they have most access to local people to make connections. They need to make more connections. They cannot count on kinship relationships, for example. Um, and this, so this makes sense, but does this happen everywhere? And the answer to that is surprising. If we look at a prefecture nearby, Wen Wenzhou, very important prefecture in Southern Song in particular. But when we look at this during the Yuan dynasty and say, who are the central people in the networks that Wenzhou literati participate in? What we find is in fact that very few of them are local. The red nodes are Wenzhou natives. And when we ask precisely who, where those people come from, all of a sudden we discover that it's the Wuzhou natives who are playing larger roles in the counties, in the, prefe in the prefecture of Wenzhou and its subordinate counties. And this is an interesting phenomenon because it suggests that whereas in Southern Sung, we happen to know that Wenzhou literati were very influential. It's clear that in Southern Sung, when it comes to Wenzhou, Wuzhou literati are much more influential than Wenzhou people. And that's confirmed here. Um, in blue are, this is the leading central figures, right? for Wenzhou literati networks during the Yuan dynasty. Yu Ji from Jiangxi is very important. He was also important in Wuzhou. But then in dark blue, we see um, Wenzhou literati. And only two of the leading figures in red are local people from Wenzhou. And when we graph this on a map, it looks something like this. These are all the the scholarly literary networks of Wenjo literati. And we see that they in fact um, rely much more, they're brought together much more by people outside. And that leads me to my question, which is why is it that some places are more successful in producing network leaders? Were there patterns in the extent of the networks of important figures. Um, were these patterns local? Were they regional? Were they national? Right? You might say that perhaps the Wenzhou case reflects who produced Wenji and which Wenji survived. But then if that's true, we could say, why was it that in Yuan, so few Wenzhou literati produced Wenji. And why was it that so many Wuzhou and Jiangxi literati produced Wenji and had such influence? In other words, we should not assume that all places are equal, that literati networks and the history of learning, the history of Chinese thought and intellectual life is something that changes by place over time. And it's by taking, even within the limitations of our sources, by aggregating large amounts of data that I think we begin to see how these patterns change. Now, if you want to see how I explain the Wujo case as part of the intellectual history of Wujo, which is, in fact, most of this book is about intellectual history, not about social networks, but you will be able to read my book on localizing learning, the literary enterprise of Wujo from 1100 to 1600, when it comes out in the fall or spring, in the spring of 2022 from Harvard. So that's the um, account I wanted to give about how I've approached thinking about networks as a, an approach to understanding or, or asking questions about 
intellectual history and local society from the Sung into the Ming. And thank you very much.